So welcome to Ask the Nurse. I am um, thrilled to have Sally Tisdale with us today. Ever since I had the good fortune of interviewing you, Sally, for Death FAQ a couple of few years ago, um, you were one of, and I interviewed probably 75 people, you were one of like the very top most memorable interviews for me. And I've always thought any other opportunity that I would have to talk to you, I would gladly uh, invite Thank it. You. Thank yeah. you. So <clears throat> Sally is the author of 10 books, um, including Advice for Future Corpses, which is a brilliant and extremely helpful book about getting ready to die. Um, it's for all of us. It's for we're all dying, but we all also are going to at some point, if not already, be with loved ones who are dying. Um, she is a nurse, a writer, and a Zen te teacher, currently an RN in a palliative care program and a staff trainer for end-of-life care. So thank you, Sally Tisdale. Um, I'd love to talk about basically just how to show up for someone who's dying, who's approaching death um, or actively dying. Right. I know that a lot of us, a lot of people really get, um, can get uncertain or awkward or have our own stuff come up when we're in that space and really like just seems like some of us just lose all understanding of just how to be human sometimes right. in the scenario right. when we're sitting with somebody who's dying and we're afraid of like, what do I say? What do I not say? All of these things. So can we just start with... Um, in this situation, what do we say or what do we not say? Right, right. And, you know, and I feel so sad when I hear, when I talk to families who say, oh, I just can't visit. It's just too, it's too upsetting or, or I just don't know what to say. So I just can't go. It's uh, what a thing to give away. What mm -hmm. a thing to not take advantage of. I, I like to remind all of us that we only get one shot at this. You know, you get one shot at your own death, obviously, but you only get one shot at your mother's and you only get one shot at your best friend and, and to avoid it, it's a terrible thing to give away. So yes, it's uncomfortable. It's painful. Um, it's also joyful and profound and funny. It's a lot of things. It's powerful stuff. So how do you show up? First, you just show up. I think that's the most important thing is just show up with whoever you are right now, just come um, and be open to surprise. I like, the, I like the exercise of stopping before you go in the door and doing a real internal, you know, a real internal scan what am I bringing in the room? Do I, and I do this as a nurse as well, not just as a, as a friend or relative. Do I have an agenda here? Is there something I'm trying to get out of this visit? Is there something I'm trying to avoid in this visit? Um, because we tend to go in and then try to, to move the conversation in certain ways to get our own needs met. So if we know going in that we have needs and that we're going to that we want to get those needs met, it will help us to kind of slow down a little bit. And, and then it's time to ask yourself if there's some other way you can get those needs met. Because the person who is dying is the center of the story. And I see it happen often that families come in and it becomes about their story. I, I don't like the word closure. I, don't mm -hmm. want to hear people talk about how they need to go see their brother so they can get closure because that's not about their brother. Um, mm -hmm. That's about their needs. And we never get closure forever. My mother died when I was just 30, which was quite young for me to lose my mother. I had three little kids and she died fairly quickly of um, breast cancer. And I'm 65 now and I still have a relationship with my mother. It has evolved. We talk. Um, we get along great, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> you know? 
I sorted out a bunch of stuff in my relationship with my mom, but it's not like she just went away. We, I am, I am the product of everybody I knew. And when they're physically no longer with me, they are still part of my life. So it is that that's the number one thing I would say is, is remember whose story it is. It's not your story. It's their story. And you need to go to be with their story. And yeah, you're going to feel awkward. You're going to feel clumsy. You're probably going to say the wrong thing at some point. And we're all just doing the best we can. Uh, so openness and awareness of your own material, if I can say it that way, is very helpful. Then I also see families come in and then they start bickering with each other. And one of the things I do as a nurse is to shoo people out of the room and say, let's take this elsewhere. Oh, God. Um, let's have it not be about that story. Um, <laughs> recently, we had a, a fellow who was just dying of, of quite old age and very peacefully dying, but one person in the family decided to inherit more quickly and was stripping the room. <laughs> of yeah, items, I you know, so... Um, so it becomes this big mess and there's, there's George in the bed and, and that's, mm. not, that's not good for George. So, <laughs> so know your stuff. That's my best advice. Show up and know your stuff and, and ask questions and be open to surprises. God, this is make, so make sense? Yeah. Yes. It makes so, so much sense. Go ahead. I was just going to say that that moment of stopping before you go in, people don't take advantage of that. They, they're, they're tense. And so they park the car and they rush in and they just kind of dash right in. And it's like, hold on, take 10 mm -hmm. slow breaths, get settled where you are, and then go in quietly and calmly. And yeah. we, yeah. I have to do that as a nurse, too. Um, we're always trying to get ahead of things. So. I wish everybody on the planet could hear what you're saying. Um, you know, when you're talking to it, it reminded me of something that you told me when I interviewed you a couple of years ago and that, and I have shared this with so many people and remembered it myself and in, in times when somebody I love is dying. And you said, it takes a lot, what people don't realize because it looks so passive is it takes a lot of work to die. Like there's a lot of stuff going on inside a dying person, like a body dying is, a lot of energy is being expelled. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and it's like, I don't think we realize that. And another, you know, you talk about like um, somebody coming in and, and like wanting something, like if they haven't cleaned up the relationship and, and mom is dying, like coming in and wanting to clean up the relationship so they don't carry it after mom dies. But it's really selfish Mm -hmm. to come and do that while mom's dying right and it's it's selfish i understand the impulse but it's also not something that mom can help you with at that point you know um as people i'm glad you brought this up about the effort um as people approach the end of their life they their world gets smaller and smaller and i don't just mean that they don't get out of bed anymore the mental world goes inward, the emotional world turns inward. Um, and so it looks, often looks as though people are asleep or unconscious, but they may, I, I often get the feeling that they are simply so internally turned that, that they don't have the attention span for what's mm -hmm. happening. Um, and yet people know you're there. So being able to be there in a very calm and unre un undemanding way is mm -hmm. important. Um, when people, I, I remember when my mother was dying, my father just couldn't stop leaning over the bed and touching her and saying, please don't go, don't leave me, please don't go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was heartbreaking to watch. And my mother just hung on in this semi- alert state for a couple of days mm -hmm. until finally my sister-in-law who's also a nurse and I convinced him to go get a rest 
and get out of the room. She died within five minutes of him oh, leaving the room. And I'm completely convinced that she was, she was a kind person who took good care of my dad and she couldn't break his heart until he was, you know, I, I think we have a lot of, a lot of power that way over the person. So I have this image of people walk, we're all walking down this road together and we, we come to a fork in the road and one person takes the right fork and the rest of us are going to go down the left fork. Mm -hmm. And so maybe they look back over their shoulder a few times and they wave a few times, but then they're going to turn and keep going. And we can stand there and call to them and beg them to come back, but they've already turned down that road. Um, and we have to watch them go. We have to let them go. Um, all that calling back, wanting to be forgiven, wanting to review things, wanting to, you know, to say something is a way of trying to call a person back. Mm -hmm. And the, the generous and loving thing to do is to say, I love you, goodbye. And let them go. And then keep walking your own road. Um, with the memory of that, of that relationship forever. And I have never, of all the people who have died in my life, I've never had one that died without something undone, but that's the work of the next day. You know, we, mm. we, for weeks, months, years, or the rest of your life, you resolve those things that were unresolved. And I think it's important to just Remind yourself that you're not who you were. We've all doing the best we can. We've all made mistakes and we have time to sort it out. It doesn't have to be done right now. Brings up so many things, like so many things that I want to say all at once. But, you know, one, one thing that, that something that you said brought up just now was when my grandparents were dying last year, my grandpa was in ICU. My grandma was in hospice house. We were going back and forth. My uncles and I were going back and forth between the two. Once they let us into ICU because he was dying of COVID, once they knew he was dying, they let us come in with all the gear. But during that both times, neither one of them in the last few days were speaking at all. And that's, I'm thinking about you saying they go more and more narrow and more and more inward. And it's like, I. I think that this is important for people to know too, is that, um, you know, I've heard people in the room with somebody who's dying say, oh, they, they don't, they're not, they don't know what we're talking about. And I'm like, no, they, the hearing is the last thing to go from what I've heard. But not only that, like when even, even one of my papa's nurses said something like, I'm not sure if he's had some brain damage from his something dropping so low or something, but I'm like, he's basically, they were saying, I don't know if he's alert enough to know what you're saying. But when I told him that my grandma was dying, he did like this and, you know, a tear comes down. And so would you say like when somebody is dying, would you say it's a safe bet to think that they can always hear you? Uh, what have you got to lose by assuming that's true? Um, because if it's, if it is true, don't make a mistake you know it's I, I thoroughly believe that I think we have to be very uh, just assume that people are awake even if they don't appear to be awake um, they they are doing a lot of work but we have lots of evidence that people are aware of what's happening in the room including the fact that people have significant a normal brain activity all the way past the moment of clinical death um, the brain doesn't stop working and hearing is a direct connection to the brain. So is smelling, you know, uh, the mm. sense in the room are important. They need to be the sense that a person that, that, you know, how much smell evokes memory. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and touch, and you have to be attentive to people's response. So if somebody tenses up when you touch them, that might mean they're having pain, although it's more likely that they just don't really want to be touched, right. that their skin right. is very sensitive. Um, if we're just mainly, I go back to what I said at the beginning, if you're mainly concerned with your own needs, and if you're mainly focused on your needs, you're going to miss these cues. 
Um, you know, one of the things I do the most with, with people who are dying is normalize the process for the family. Mm. Um, because one reason people get tense and awkward in the room is they don't understand what the physical signs are. And they, they jump to some really negative conclusions about what's going on. Um, like a noisy breathing, moist breathing or noisy breathing or grunting sounds that people make are perfectly normal physiological changes that have to do with the way the body is changing. And I often will stand by the bed and just say, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing somebody who looks relaxed. I'm seeing um, somebody who seems really calm. I don't see signs of pain. This noisy breathing is perfectly normal. Um, and just sort of really try to calm that sense of this is terrible, something terrible is happening. It's, it's labor, it's work, it's a kind of birth. Um, so it can be dramatic and it can be very quiet, but most people die very peacefully and very quietly. Uh, it just isn't gonna look like taking a nap. <laughs> Right. But yes, yeah, first question, I would always assume the person is aware of what's happening. Um, well, that circles me back somewhere in there that you said a minute or two ago, too, circles me back to the, my second question when I the, a few things came up during the last question. And that is, do you have any tips for how someone say that like, I'm in the room with someone I love who's dying and um, I wish I could think of a specific example. Basically, like we all have our ideas about what it should look like or what should be happening. And so, and a lot of that is like a deeply triggered feeling of like, and so do you have any tips for how to, like if you catch yourself in that situation and you're trying to not make it about you or your stuff that you're bringing in the room or your reactions, how does one do that? Right. Well, like I said, be, be um, open to surprise. Um, we think, I have this <laughs> cartoon I'm really fond of, of an old man in bed talking to his family and he's saying, these are my last words. No, no, wait a minute. These are my last words. <laughs> I, no, wait a minute. Um, we have this I, these ideas about what it's going to look like. It's either going to be somebody goes to sleep and doesn't wake up and it's just just like that. It just looks like someone's sleeping or somebody is saying their last words and then they slump over, right? Um, or, and some people have this very fearful idea that somebody is going to be screaming in pain and lashing out and, you know, uh, flailing in the bed and not be cared for. Um, all those things can happen, but all three of those things are pretty rare. What, what really happens is that people may be moving around. They may be looking restless. They may be making sounds. They may be breathing noisy. That doesn't mean they're not peaceful. It doesn't mean they're not pain-free. It means that some other changes are happening in the body. Like, um, there's terminal restlessness. And it, it, it just means that the oxygen and carbon dioxide changes in the body are making the muscles move around. So people, you know, they might, but some people, about half of people who are um, semi-conscious have engaged in conversations with people that are not there. And they have entire, entire experiences that we are not taking part in women rock babies, they knit sweaters, they go to parties, um, they talk to Joe over in the corner and it's surprisingly common. Um, I don't know, you've seen, I'm sorry to say, I'm sorry that you've had so many people that you've lost this year, but you might've seen this kind of pick, what we call picking. Mm -hmm. We don't know what people think they're doing, but they are engaging in a very real experience. Um, what does it mean? I don't know, but it's normal. And so I wanna normalize these things. If a person's restless, there's things we can do about it. If a person has noisy breathing, there's ways we can work with that. But the most important thing is to realize this is actually what dying looks like. It's not mm -hmm. like the cartoons. 
It's not like the movies. Um, this is what dying looks like. How do, how does one make peace? Like, ha like having heard this conversation or even before having heard this conversation, if somebody feels like they did it wrong when somebody they love was dying, it's already dead now. How do you make peace with that? Feeling like I'm, you did it wrong at the bedside. I'm doing that right now for myself because um, one of my best friends died last fall, not of COVID, but of cancer. I'm and sorry. But we were in the surge. So I managed to get him to the hospital that I'm that I work at that I'm familiar with. Um, and we could have one person at the bedside at a time. Um, and I knew he was dying. I we had sorted all that stuff out, but I didn't start crying until I suddenly realized we can't gather. We mm -hmm. can't have a vigil. Um, I knew that intellectually, but suddenly I was right. on the other side of it and I was alone at the bedside with a shield and a mask and, and I said the wrong thing. I said a secret of his to the nurse. Out loud. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me like, don't, why did you say that? Mm -hmm. And I felt awful, you know, and it was one of our last exchanges. Mm -hmm. So um, when I think about Steve's death now, that tends to come up and I just think, okay, all right. The, yeah. It's how you work with any other thing from the it's past. Urban. I'm, I'm yeah. not who I am. I'm not today who I was then. That's something I've, and this is the Zen coming up here. I've inherited that person. And um, all I can do is the best I can do right now. Mm -hmm. um, and let it go. It's gone. I think Steve's fine. And um, he actually had a very quiet, peaceful death in the middle mm -hmm. of the night after we'd left. And it was what it was, you know, um, accepting that this happened is a, such a significant part of being an adult. Lots of people spend a lot of time in their adulthood trying to avoid accepting that certain things have happened. They don't, they, they, they flinch or they turn away from difficult things in their lives. And there's a part of them that just will not accept that that happened. And if you can start with that, this happened. I did that. This was done to me, whatever. Start from there. Yeah. And you, you are doing the best you can. We're all doing the best we can. Um, and we aren't going to get it perfect. So we do it the best we can. Mm. I'm working on this in myself. I was afraid that I like got on my papa's nerves and I was like with him for 12 hours before, you know, and he died after I left, of course, in the middle of the night. But, but there's <laughs> just a little bit like, did I talk to, I was doing all of this stuff where I was trying to, he was suffering, struggling a lot. And I was, you know, kind of like whispering to him to relax parts of his body. And he would respond to all that. But there were times when I was like, I was telling him that, you know, he did everything right. And, and I was so grateful for him being my papa and all this. But then I later, I was like, should I have just shut up like the whole time? You know, it's all of this stuff that's so, it is just so tender, you know, it's right. just so Right. And, you know, lots of people are very uncomfortable with silence, especially when they're anxious. But that is something you ask, what can we bring to the bedside? Periods of silence is a, a good one. And periods of solitude is important. It's, I don't know that anyone's ever done the research, but it, the anecdotal evidence is so strong that lots of people will only die alone. It's, it, you know, it's, a true, it's a true, certainly a truism for nurses and doctors that you have to leave the room regularly and give people some solitude. I can't think of a more private experience um, and I think it's quite possible that's going to be my choice, that I'm a kind of a private person and I don't want a bunch of people <laughs> staring at me. <laughs> my most vulnerable moment <laughs> ever. Very intimate, vulnerable thing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and the chit chatting, you know, it's okay to sit at the bedside and chat with your brother about how their kids are doing and so on. Right. What I think the mistake is trying to pull the dying person into conversations about 
all the parts of life they've left behind. Yeah. People, and this is long before people stop talking, they do reach a point where they're not interested anymore. They're not in the social world anymore. Um, and if you go in and you want to talk about your vacation to Hawaii next month, there's something really just <laughs> off yeah. about that. And no, no. people, do, yeah. people yeah. do that because they're anxious and they don't know what to talk about. You don't have to talk about anything. Yeah. You can do some knitting and put on some quiet music and um, neaten up the room and then go to the bathroom and come back and just have it be very quiet, normal time. I think this is an important part too, to touch on it, how, how extremely important it is to, to talk to your loved ones about what you, what you imagine you would want beforehand. Because when I went in, to birth my child. I like the smell of lavender. You know, my girlfriend brought the aromatherapy stuff and we had a playlist and all this stuff. And when I was actually in labor, I was like, oh, turn that thing off. Like the lavender was making me want to vomit. And I was like, oh. and then I was like, no music with words. And, you know, there were these things where it was like the intensity of what my body was going through is the, you know, most, I know I've never died, but I have given birth, which is just an extremely intense physical situation so I think that even like turning on music when someone's dying if if like you know my dad loved Elvis but I wasn't going to put on Elvis when my dad was dying because it didn't seem like what he would want <laughs> like, right right you and, have to you have to pay attention you know if you if you put some music on and the person suddenly gets more restless yeah. Attend to it. If they get calmer, yeah, that might be telling you something. It's um yeah, it, it being just aware of the circumstances is important. And again, people just tend to kind of go into their own stuff and they need to open up and see what's really happening in the room. Um, uh, for sure. Now I do an exercise with people in which I ask them to write down their their fantasy ideal death. Mm -hmm. um, and it's often, you know, lots of meadows and sunshine and loving hands and, and, and the ex the point of the exercise is, okay, now tear that up, do the, you know, write it down, give it to all your loved ones. Now tear it up because you are not going to get to decide. It might look like that. Chances are it won't. It, you know, it, we all think we want to die at home until the reality of a hospital bed and a commode in the living room comes to the fore and suddenly you realize there's nobody there at three in the morning that can lift you and you know there's dying at home is a lot more complex than people think and um it just may not look like that and even a person dying of cancer can actually die of a heart attack um so right. You know, you think it'll look like this and it ends up looking like something else. Um, tomorrow when I go to work, my job is um, that we've, we've just brought back a person who decided to quit dialysis. Now, dialysis is interesting. It is a life support technique. It is a, um, you know, it is life-saving. And when right. you quit dialysis, people usually die within two to seven days. Some live a little bit longer than that. So he made a conscious decision a few days ago that I'm, you know, basically I'm going to die within a week and I want to do it in my own bed. Well, so tomorrow I'm going to see whether we've got everything organized properly for that to happen and whether we have what we need and whether he, you know, and just do the whole assessment. Um, so, and I want to see if he knows exactly what is happening. So what that looks like. And yeah. But yeah. I, I, I am so curious about this decision. Um, it, it's, I just wonder what does it feel like to know that you're going to be dead within a week? I, people ask me how I imagine my own death and I, or how I'm approaching my own death. And, you know, I freely admit that if a car is coming at me, I feel the same adrenaline rush everybody else does. And, you know, don't, no, no, no. Everybody has that organic resistance to death. But I'd like to think that when the time comes, I am approaching it with curiosity 
primarily mm -hmm. and grace and willingness um, to accept what can't be avoided, but it could be a great adventure. And I'm really interested in what it's like to consciously choose it. So I'll do my best for him tomorrow and we'll see where things are. And this is also a family that says, we fully support this, but we're not gonna come visit. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, as soon as you said it, as soon as you said, this is his choice to come off dialysis and knowing that he'll die within days, and it's like, this is one of those examples I couldn't think of earlier. And we'll close with this is like, okay, so I pretend I'm a family member. And I would, of course, be, I would be supportive because I've been doing this work for a long time. But, but the 27 year old me may have been like, that's no the way. age I was when my, when my dad died. But I was also supportive of him. But it's some, you know, some part of me would want to be like, no, you know, and say that you're this man's daughter or wife or whomever. Um, in that moment, it's like practicing dialing back your own interests to honor theirs right. is the yeah. highest. You know, I, I do want to, I'll, I'll have a little caveat for my saying, why would you, why would you want to skip this great opportunity? When my father was dying, I saw him, the last time I saw him was three weeks before he died. Um, we had a very, a very conflicted and fraught relationship, and I had a positive, loving visit with him and decided stop there because it was unusual. It was rare for us to have a warm and loving interaction. And um, I had, you know, I was telling others uh, another story about why I wasn't going, but the real story was. I don't want to lose that as my last memory. I want that to be the way we said goodbye. And there are relationships like that. And if family will not come, I have to assume that there's probably a lot I don't know about yes. what that decision is made of. Of course. Yeah. And if you can come and get past your discomfort and there's not a real solid reason just that you're uncomfortable, please come. <laughs> yeah. And I'm yeah. still, I'm still, there's times when I think, you know, it would have been good to be there at the end, but it was the best I could do at the time. That was the best that who I was then could do was to hope for a positive Absolutely. bye. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we are at time, Sally, uh, and somebody just commented that she wished the convo could go on all day, and so do I. Um, this is just always sincerely, I just love talking to you. You bring such uh, insight and wisdom to the table in such a really just pure and simple way, and I just appreciate you very much. Are there any questions that need to be answered yeah, here? Yeah, if you're okay with going maybe like just five minutes later and anybody wants to stay on is welcome to. Um, um, Teresa asked, what do you mean by it's a kind of birth? Early in the conversation, you said that death is like a kind of birth. I think you were talking I, about it. Well, what I'm talking about is what, you know, you just alluded to how much, what a physically intense experience it is to, to go through childbirth. There is a I mean, what a dramatic transformation we are going through when we die. Mm -hmm. um, everything that we think of as the self is going to unwind. Whatever your beliefs about the afterlife or the, the meaning of the human is, it's going to transform as dramatically as possible. So that's what I mean by birth. Something new comes mm -hmm. out of that. Um, mm -hmm. And we let go of what was before. You are never the person who didn't give birth. You're never the person who didn't have a child. You're never the person you were again. And um, that's what I mean. And it's actually Ira Bayak who first um, started making a comment about that, that it's it's hard work. And we I should remember. Ira. Yeah. yeah, we're doing a book club with Ira actually with his four things that matter most. Um, Okay, so 
other question was, what's the checklist you'll go through with your patient who has decided he's going off life-saving support? Okay, so this is the 40 years of nursing. It's just all right here. I don't have to write it down, you know. Um, we, I tend to start at the head and go down, you know, and the head is what's his state of mind? What's his emotional um, temperature right now? What's his mentation? How conscious is he? Is he in pain? Is he anxious, et cetera? You know, and then you're just going to go through the systems. Is he breathing comfortably? Um, are, are, his, are his muscles relaxed and so on? Um, so dealing with all the physical stuff and getting a sense of what his mentation and his mood are, um, and then safety issues in the room. Are there, you know, is he, is he restless? Do we need to worry about a fall? Is it, it you know, is that sort of thing. That's the checklist. But the real checklist is then sitting quietly at the bedside and just observing, just really letting my intuition and my experience come to the fore and say, does Bill look okay? Mm -hmm. does, does Bill have what he needs? Is there tension? And where is there tension? Um, and then with, in, in his case, in this patient's case of going off dialysis and, and dying, can you keep him comfortable physically? Yeah. yeah. Kidney failure tends to be a real sort of fade out. Mm -hmm. um, the, the toxins accumulate in the blood and very quickly people tend to lose consciousness, become very sleepy and just fade out. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's usually very quiet. So we'll just see how he looks tomorrow. Blessings to him, yeah. Sally. Thank you. Thank you for all. Right. All right. Thank you all for listening and um, do your best. We're all doing our best. That's right. I hope to see you again soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Goodbye, everybody.